Good morning, good afternoon, good evening again, YouTube, and welcome back to another edition of FX Studio 2. I am your host, G Sharp Jams. Now, today's video, we're going to be taking a look at compression again, and here's why. I recently put out, and if you haven't had a chance, go back and take a look at those two videos, but I recently put out two videos on compressors as opposed to limiters, and I put out a video about the different brands of compressors and the different types of compressors that are out there, like the Verimu, the FET, the VCA, so on and so forth. I received tremendous response to those videos. People are watching those videos. You're sending me emails, asking me questions. You're leaving comments in the comments box. I appreciate it all because it's telling me that you are engaged. So that means I'm doing something right. And because of that, I decided to go ahead and make this video first and put the other videos that I had planned to come out with next. I put those aside. I said, well, if there's such a heavy interest in this, why don't I just continue on and make another video about compression? This video, however, is going to be about different settings. We're not going to talk about compressors. We're not going to talk about what is a ratio and what is an attack and what is a release. We're going to be talking about what settings should I use on an attack for a particular sound or instrument? What settings should I use on a release for a particular sound or a particular instrument? So on and so forth. So that's going to be what this video is all about. If you're new to compression, this will come in very helpful for you. If you're already used to compression and you just want a few more pointers, something you may have overlooked or something you don't quite understand, this may be the video for you. If you're more involved with compression and you already understand the basics and how to use your different settings on different instruments and sounds, I'll see you next week in my next video because this is probably going to bore you. We don't want to do that. We want to keep people engaged. But anyway, we're going to get to that in just a moment. But first, this. Okay, so welcome back, and we're going to go ahead and get started with the video. Now, before we do, I just want to say this, just so we create a flow with this video, make it a lot easier for you to follow along with what I'm saying here and to get a better understanding as we move along throughout the video. Compression is something that is, it's easy to understand, but for some reason, folks overcomplicate what they need to do with a compressor. And believe me, it's not that difficult to understand. What I want to do here is stop you, if this is you, from just getting in there and using your compressor and start turning dials until you get something to sound right. Instead, think about what you're doing, think about what you're hearing, and then make the decision as to what it is that you should do. For instance, if you can keep these few things in mind, Understanding compression and how to use proper settings on your compressor will help you tremendously. Just remember these few things. Different sounds have different characteristics. You have sounds, and when I say sounds, I'm, when I use the word sounds, I'm talking about different instruments. They could be horns, they could be guitars, they could be vocals, whatever. So when I say sounds, that's what I'm talking about, just to make things simple. Different sounds have different characteristics. You may have a sound that is very low heavy, or it has very low frequency, Very, I should say very heavy on the low frequencies. You have other sounds that are very heavy on the high frequencies. Two different things there, two different settings that you should be using, and we're going to get to those. You also have sounds that are either very loud, or you have sounds that are very soft. Two different types of characteristics, two different settings that you should be using. You also have sounds that are very transient heavy. Different characteristic, different type of setting that you should be using. Now, what are those settings that I'm referring to? Well, I'm referring to your attack, 
your release, your ratio, and your threshold. Now, again, we're gonna I'm gonna go through this part very quickly because this is not a review of what they are, but if you're new to the channel or you're new to compression, I'm gonna run through this part very quickly just for you. Okay, so remembering that when we talk about attack, we're talking about attack time. The time that it takes for that compression to kick in. That's what attack is. That attack can be very fast or that attack can be very slow. Then you have release. Once the attack hits, how slow or how fast does it let go? That's your release time. Then you have ratio. Ratio is very simply the amount of compression that you're applying to that sound and then using the attack and using the release on top of that. Then you have the threshold. Threshold, very easy to understand. The threshold is very simply dB, decibels. The level or the volume where you want that compression to kick in. Do I want my compression to kick in at 3 dB or 6 dB or it's 10 dB or 1 dB? That's what threshold is. So if you understand those four things, you understand compression. And if you understand what I've discussed just a little bit early about the different characteristics of sound, wrap your head around those things and compression will become very simple for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to take my face off the camera here and I'm going to go ahead and post some images that I've prepared for you for this video. So you'll be listening to me, but you'll be looking at the images. So follow along to make it a lot easier for you to understand and take some notes if you need to take notes. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. Okay, let's begin this discussion by talking about attack and release. Now, if you were to use a very slow release and a slow attack, that's going to give your sound a more natural feel to it because you're not hitting it hard, you're not hitting it quickly, you're hitting it very slowly, and then you're releasing the compression very slowly. So this becomes more of a natural sound. However, if you're using a fast attack and a fast release, it's really kicking in a lot quicker, so it's having more of an effect on the sound that you're processing. You want to use something with a fast attack and a fast release where you have a sound where you want to let the tail ring. Now, for instance, when I say tail, I want you to think about a reverb, for instance. A reverb has either a very long tail or a short tail. If it's a short tail, it lasts a little bit sh sh shorter. If it's a long tail, that reverb can go to infinity and you get that huge echo coming out of the sound that you're processing. So think about fast attack and fast release in that sense. If you're using, again, if you're using a fast attack and a fast release, you're, you're letting that tail ring out. Now let's move on to using a fast attack and a fast release when you're side chaining, okay? When you're side chaining, you definitely want to use a fast attack and a fast release because the sound that you're trying to control is going to decrease at a faster rate, letting the other compressed sound that you've side chained come through clearer. And a good setting for that is about five to one. So remember, these are just starting points. I'm not saying that these are definites. These aren't anything that's written in stone, nothing concrete, but a good starting point when you're side chaining is about five to one. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Now, here's a trick that I want to point out for you when it does come to side chaining. Try turning the release, or, uh, excuse me, not turning, try timing the release to the song's tempo. Now think about that. If you're timing the release time to the tempo of the song, what are you doing? You're creating a rhythmic balance. There's a balance that's occurring because you're releasing that compression in step with the tempo of that song. So it creates a rhythm 
that is uniform with what's going on in that song. Just a quick tip on side chaining and using compression in side chaining. But now let's get to the, the meat of what the, the, this discussion is all about. And that is different settings to be used on different sounds. Okay, we're gonna start with vocals. Now, of course, you're gonna have female vocals and you're going to have male vocalists. And I'm also gonna throw in rock vocalists, the, the guys that scream on into the mic, these hard rock singers. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. For a female vocalist, you wanna use a ratio of two to one or four to one. You don't wanna to go too heavy on the compression when you're compressing a female vocal and simply because female vocalists tend to have softer voices. So you don't wanna kill what's already soft and make it even softer to the point where it comes out muddy or it sounds crushed or it just doesn't sound natural enough. So you wanna keep that ratio at about two to one to four to one. Now, of course, you may have a female vocalist who has a very strong and powerful voice. So you may wanna make some changes there. Now. With that, I want to give you a, for instance, I want to give you an example. Think about Mariah Carey. If you're not familiar with Mariah Carey, after you watch this video, listen to a few of her songs and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Mariah Carey's voice has a very dynamic range, very dynamic. She can hit high notes that are just incredible and then she can bring it right back down and she can high note after high note after high note right on top of each other it's pretty incredible what she can do with her voice now with something like that you probably want to go a little bit harder on the compression because it's peaking and we know what peaks are these are spikes and when you get those spikes when you have a female vocalist who's singing and hitting these high notes repetitively you probably want to go a little bit higher on that compression to tame those peaks so that it's not not so much overpowering everything else that's in the mix, but so that it's not coming out sounding screechy or tinny or, or something of that nature. So keep that in mind. Next, you have the male vocal. Now, with the male vocal, remember that a male singer more than likely is going to have a much lower tone to his voice. Where there's lower tone, there are lower frequencies. So we want to use a higher ratio than we would for a female vocalist. And for a male vocal, I would say a good starting point will be somewhere between four to one and six to one. Next, you have the rock vocalist. The thing I said I was gonna throw in here and talk about. Now remember, a rock vocalist, they have that very heavy, very grungy, very loud voice. And they just belt out these vocals. Something like that, you want to go even a little bit higher, maybe six to one or eight to one on the amount of compression that you're using, that ratio, because you want to tame it down a little. You still want them to sound nice and powerful and big and stand out in the mix, but you don't want it to be to the point where it's out of control. So you want to use a higher rate of compression or that ratio. Remember this, that fast attack makes vocals thicker and that a slow attack makes vocals more aggressive might want to write that one down or take a screenshot i'm going to say it again fast attack makes vocals thicker and a slow attack makes vocals more aggressive let's move on to the next instrument and we're going to talk now about a snare drum now as i move along remember those Three things that I talked about at the very beginning of this video about the different characteristics of sounds. I'm using certain examples. Of course, I can't go through every possible instrument that's out there and tell you what settings you should be starting with as a starting point for your, your attack, your release, your threshold, and your ratio. But I'm categorizing them so that they fit into those different categories. Let me say that again. I'm categorizing them so that they fit into those different categories that I spoke about before. So we've covered vocals, loud or soft. Remember, I spoke about that in the beginning. Now we're going to talk about a snare drum, which can be loud and can be very transient heavy. For a snare drum, you want to use a ratio as a starting point somewhere between 2 to 1 and 4 to 1. The attack should be long 
to preserve those transients, those transients, if that's what you desire. Now, remember, like I always say at the end of my videos, I'm going to go ahead and say it now. There are no rules to this game. You can do whatever you want to do. If that's the sound that you're going for, go ahead and use it. And then it is right. Okay. No rules to this game. But as a rule of thumb, for a snare drum, you want that attack to be long so that you are preserving transients if that's what you desire. By preserving those transients, it's going to sound more natural instead of crushing those transients and trashing them. And now they don't even sound like transients. They just sound like mush in the mix. So you want to be careful with that. For the release... You want to time the release to the tempo of the song, just as I spoke about before with side chaining. This, because a, a, the kick drum and the snare drum are basically following the tempo of the song. You got that one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. There's the tempo of the song, so to speak. So if you time your release to the tempo of the song on a snare drum, it sounds more natural, without a doubt. Now let's move on to a kick drum. With a kick drum, because it's more bass heavy, it's more boomy, it's, it lets out a lot more energy, you want something higher than your two to one. So you might want to go four to one, or you might even want to go six to one on the ratio. More compression, because there's a lot of energy being released in that kick drum. The attack should be very slow. I shouldn't say very slow, but slow. You don't want it coming in too quickly because then you kill off that energy too quick and it doesn't sound like a kick drum anymore. Okay, so you want a slow attack and you want a slow release. You don't want to release it too quickly because now too much of that energy is being released. You want it nice and slow so that it's ringing. You want to hear that thump and then you want to hear that, that, that after effect of that thump coming through so you want to let go of it very slowly and let that thing ring out. Your threshold. Now, this is something that you have to play with, but the threshold as a rule of thumb, again, nothing concrete here, nothing's written in stone, but the threshold, again, threshold being the volume level where you want that compression to hit and kick in should be somewhere about two to six dB. And again, that's just the general rule of thumb. Next, we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about hi-hats. Now, if you took a look at my video that I did on the Rupert Neve 542, you know that it works great on hi-hats. It just makes them sing. It makes them sparkle, and it makes them stand out. But now, right now, we're talking about compression. I just want to throw that in. If you haven't watched that video, go back and watch that video. But for hi-hats, these are things that ring, that that those transients. That's what a transient is. Now, because they are transient heavy and they tend to ring out, you want to use a slower attack to let those transients come out without dulling them. If you put on too much, uh, too much attack on a hi-hat, you're going to dull the transients and you're going to end up with a dull sounding hi-hat. So you want to use a slow attack let those transients come through, but you're letting them come through and taming them at the same time so that there aren't too much transients coming through from those hi-hats. The ratio should be about two to one. You don't want to overcompress this thing, but you want to apply some compression there. So leave it about two to one. You might want to experiment with four to one, but two to one is generally the rule of thumb with hi-hats. Again, you don't want it too heavy. Anything higher then two to one is going to make the hi-hat sound unnatural. And that's not what we want to do. The next and final piece that we're going to talk about is an acoustic guitar. Now, personally, for an acoustic guitar, I like to use an FET compressor, simply because I like that added grit and grunge that an FET compressor can bring to an acoustic guitar. But... Other people will say, no, you're better off using something nice and clean like a VCA compressor. And that's fine. It's just a matter of personal taste. But either way, for an acoustic guitar, you want the ratio or the rate of compression, how much of compression you're applying to be at about four to one. Kind of in the middle. 
not too much, not too little. You, you're strumming that guitar and you want all of that to come through, but you want to kill some of those highs and you want to tame some of those lows so they don't sound too muddy. So you want to be somewhere right in the middle, somewhere about four to one. Then you want to experiment with a different attack and release time until it sounds right or smooth to you. And I say experiment. Now, there are folks out there who say, no, well, attack time should be this and a release time on an acoustic guitar should be this. And I'm not going to say that they're wrong. In my personal opinion, I say experiment with different attack and release times and see what works for that particular mix. Because some guitarists are very heavy handed. Some guitarists are very light handed. Some guitarists do a lot of fast picking and some guitarists just play the guitar nice and rhythm rhythmically and nice and smooth so you have to experiment with your attack and release times to find what sounds right okay so that's going to wrap up the video today and i just want to point something out again going back to the very beginning of this video when i said that, that there are different characteristics to different sounds and Learning what those different characteristics are is going to help you to learn how to apply compression settings a lot easier and a lot better than what you've been doing instead of just sitting there and turning knobs. You either have a sound that's loud or it's soft. You have a sound that may be transient heavy or it is not. You may have a sound that has very heavy on the low frequencies or sounds that have, are very heavy on the high frequencies. Before you start compressing, ask yourself the question, what am I listening to? Am I listening to something that is more on the low end or am I listening to something that's very high on the high end, the high frequencies? Am I listening to something that's transient heavy or not? Am I listening to a big powerful vocal or am I listening to a soft female vocal? You see where I'm going with this? If you can remember to ask yourself those questions before you start spinning those compressor knobs, you're going to do yourself a huge favor and compression is going to come so much easier for you to understand and apply correctly because it is really that simple. Again, compression, probably one of the most overthought, misunderstood, overused pieces of gear within your recording studio's arsenal. But if you can apply these principles, you're gonna do just fine. That's the video for today. I'm gonna to say it again. I know I said it earlier in the, the video, but I'm gonna say it again. Keep creating, think outside of the box, and remember there are no rules to this game. Whatever you wanna do, go ahead and do it. If that's the sound that you're looking for, then it's right. Until next time, Everybody have a great rest of your day and I'll see you next time.